So today, today is a great day. Today is actually one of my favorite days of the year. What, why do you think that is? Okay, it's the last class meeting for spring break. That's a, that's a really good reason to love today. Uh, can you think of another reason? The March Madness, exactly. Today is the first day of the rest of my life. Every, every year, this, this may be my favorite day of the year because it's the beginning of a four-day period where I fill my body with like guacamole and uh, I just fill, like I replace the marrow in my bones with guacamole. Uh, and I just sit around, it's beautiful. And, but I gave up all that to come in here and give you a lecture, even though Memphis is maybe being upset as we speak. The Cal game is starting at noon. So, all right, so before we run off to watch Cal defeat Maryland, those ridiculous Terrapin uh, opponents of ours, uh, let's do a lecture and let's learn something. Um, specifically today, let's learn about the Southern culture of honor. And this is one of my favorite topics to talk about in social psychology, because I think the research on the Southern culture of honor is pretty fun it's, and pretty, pretty hilarious. Shh. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what that was about. Okay. So we've been sort of moving up in levels of analysis over the last few weeks, or the last, yeah, the last few weeks. Uh, we left the cognitive biases part of the class. We were just talking about inside the mind, what goes on inside your mind and everyone's minds. Then we've moved on to conformity and then levels of identity, or identity, which we talked about three different levels of identity. Uh, one was person level, which we're not going to talk about in this class. If you want to learn about personality, we have amazing personality psychologists here uh, who you should take a class from. I wish I had been in a position to take one of their classes. Oliver John in particular is one of the world experts on personality, if not the world expert on personality. Uh, then we talked about role identities, the next level of analysis up in this typology of identities. And we covered uh, the Stanford Prison Experiment. Yeah, we did. And, and then we talked about... <laughs> We talked about the theoretical work of Irving Goffman, and then uh, we moved up to the next level of analysis, social identities, how group identities can shape individual behavior and thought, and, and vice versa, how individual behavior and thought can shape groups. And now, as long as we're going to be at this group level, we might as well do some stuff on culture. Now, culture is a concept that you don't see a lot of work on in social psychology. So what, why is this? Well, I'd say... Now, the biggest reason that you don't see much work on culture and social psychology, even though we know that culture matters and culture shapes uh, the behavior and the lives of individuals, and sociologists in particular, lo particular love to do work on culture, but social psychologists don't so much. Now, why would that be? Well, I would say there's two reasons. One is a pretty obvious reason. It's a levels of analysis issue. So cultures tend to obtain in large groups. We think of countries as having cultures, like the United States has a culture, and uh, Brazil has a culture, and so on. Also, whole continents can have cultures, right? Like European culture is perhaps different from South American culture is different from Asian culture, and Lord knows Australians are different from all of them. <laughs> so cultures obtain in large groups, even if their effects may affect the behavior of individuals in small groups. But social psychologists tend to get a little leery of talking about big groups because they tend to work with phenomena like conformity or interpersonal influence or groupthink, things that happen in small groups. And so they get a little leery when you start to talk about 300 million person groups. They're like, wow, we really don't understand how that works. So one, of it is, one aspect of this is a problem of qualifications, where social psychologists opt out of studying culture because they say, I, I don't, we don't understand groups that are that big very well. It's a micro versus a macro issue. Social psychologists are micro. Culture seems like a macro phenomenon. What's a phenomenon? Stuff that happens. That's what phenomenon is. <laughs> so another reason is that culture is very difficult to define, and its effects are very tough to pin down. And so it's a phenomenon that's hard to study systematically, you know, rigorously, concretely, and clearly. And social psychologists, if you haven't noticed, are among the social scientists who are most hung up on always being clear. They want their ideas to be clear, testable, they want to define their terms. Research on culture tends to be a little bit more vague, a little bit more amorphous, and the ideas tend to be a little bit harder to pin down. So this is an important difference, okay? Uh, social psychologists prefer clarity, and cultural research in, in general, cultural theory and research, has been a little vaguer, and, uh, and so as a result, social psychologists shy away from that discussion. But there's two 
major cultural differences that social psychologists have studied a fair amount in a fair amount of depth. Do you, do you know what they are? Can you guess what at least one of them is? OK, yes, yeah, Southerners, Southern versus, I don't know how you figure that out. but uh, So one of them is the difference between Southern and Northern folks in the United States uh, and how, how that might influence a variety of outcomes, the difference between Southerners and Northerners in the US. Another one is the difference between what they call Easterners and Westerners, by which they mean people from Asia or who have immigrated from Asia, and then people from Europe slash North America, and sometimes they mean South America, too. Um, that research is very interesting. The East-West difference research is very interesting. We're not going to cover it much in this class, uh, but you can take a cultural psychology class here at Berkeley and learn a lot about it. And in indeed, Berkeley is perhaps the leading place, along with the University of Michigan, uh, to study cultural psychology uh, in the United States. So we're not going to talk much about that, which may be disappointing to you, but we are going to talk about the southern-northern cultural difference and how it impacts behavior in everyday life. And uh, this is some of my favorite stuff. Why is this some of my favorite stuff? Because I lived in the South for nine years when I was growing up. I moved there when I was 10 years old and lived there until I was 18. And in my personal experience, my qualitative data that I gathered growing up there, uh, it, it dovetails with a lot of this research. And uh, when they talk about the culture of honor and they talk about violence in the South, this is something I definitely saw a lot of. And anybody here, who, who here has lived for a substantial period of time in the, the southern part of the United States? OK, all right. So you'll probably, you should let me know as we go through this if some of this rings true to you. I'd be very interested in your, your feedback. Um, OK, so today's lecture <clears throat> is about a puzzle. And that puzzle is the following. Why is it that the South is more violent than the rest of the country? And we have good evidence for this. There's a lot of reason to think that the South is a more violent place than the northern part of the United States. But we don't know exactly why. And there's a lot of reasons why this might be the case. Well, for one, one thing that we should observe right away is that when you look for the basis of that difference in violence between the South and the North, it's specifically amongst white males. Uh, African Americans, levels of violent crime in the South and the North, or, or, or violence that isn't crime, tends to be about the same. No big difference in African American rates of violent crime in the South and the North. Uh, women, women, very low rate of violent crime in the South and the North and everywhere else, uh, more mature gender that they are. And, but white males are much more violent in the South than in the North. Why is this? Well, a few explanations might be, might be able to answer this. So one is, in the South, there's higher levels of poverty and inequality. And uh, poverty and inequality have both been shown to increase rates of violent crime. So if the South is higher in poverty and inequality, maybe that's why there's higher levels of, of violent crime there. Um, poverty and inequality lead to crime. Poverty and inequality higher in the South. Therefore, uh, crime rates are higher in the South. And that is part of the story. That is part of the explanation for the higher rate of violent crime in the southern part of the United States. But when you do statistical analyses of perpetration of violent crime in the South and the North, this doesn't explain it all. You can statistically control for this factor, as you all learned about in SOCH 5 or some other methods class, and it doesn't explain it all. There's still a difference between the South and the North to be explained. So what else might explain it? Perhaps the legacy of slavery. Well, people have talked about that, that maybe the legacy of slavery has created uh, authoritarian white males who used to be slave owners, and there's some kind of cultural legacy of that. And people, people have talked about this. We don't have, we, it's very hard a theory to test directly. It's hard to know if maybe this factor is responsible for it. So it's hard to rule out. It's hard to test. Another explanation is temperature, which is, I think, kind of a clever explanation. So one thing that you find is that warmer places or warmer times of the year in any given place are conducive to higher rates of violent crime. And there's a lot of explanations for why this is, for why higher temperatures leads to higher rates of violent crime. Can you guess what, what one of those explanations might be? Yeah. Makes people irritable. Makes me irritable, you know? When it's hot out, you get kind of pissed off, and you're more likely to commit some kind of violent crime. Yeah. People are outside more. That's, that's excellent. Um, so if people are outside more, they're more likely to interact with one another. And then when people interact with one another, well, that's a precondition for violent crime, right? You have to be interacting with other people. 
If you're all snug in your bed, hanging out near a fireplace, which something none of you have ever experienced, uh, you're probably less likely to uh, perpetrate some kind of violent crime or get drunk in a bar and wind up hitting somebody. Yes? Uh, does that mean that in colder weather, domestic violence would be higher? Maybe. I don't know. That's very interesting. Yeah. You should test that. Somebody should test that. Um, that's a good idea. So, so these are a few reasons why you might expect the South to be more violent, uh, regardless of cultural factors, right? It's warmer. There's higher levels of poverty. There's a legacy of slavery. That might be kind of a cultural thing. But uh, even before we turn to culture, we want to be careful that, we're, that, that, that these factors aren't what or what, what is driving the higher rates of violent crime in the South. Now, the legacy of slavery thing is hard to test. Uh, it might be part of a cultural story. But we can test for poverty and inequality and temperature. And what we find is, yes, these partly explain the higher rates of violent crime in the South than in the North, but they don't explain it all. And so as we look around for explanations that can explain what's left to be explained, we turn to the following idea, which is that perhaps the South has a culture of honor that is partly responsible for the high rates of violent crime. So what does this mean? What is a culture of honor? In a culture of honor, violence is used to defend one's own and one's, fam one, uh, one's family's honor, whatever. I can't speak, but um, you get the idea. And you can probably think of cultures of honor like this, right? Like, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh. so like ancient Japan. You know, used to have a culture of honor where you would defend yourself against challenges. Or uh, we think the southern United States does. Other places, other places do as well. Uh, and, <laughs> and the researchers on the southern culture of honor say that cultures of honor are most likely to emerge when individuals are at economic risk from other people and the state is weak and insufficient. So they say, when will you get these social norms that emerge that say you, when somebody provokes you or challenges you or insults you, you need to fight them, you know, and maybe fight them to the death. When will you get these norms that emerge uh, where that's, that's the kind of behavior that you do? Probably where the individual is at economic risk of others and the state is weak and insufficient. Because if the state was strong, then the state could protect you, you know, and you wouldn't need to defend your honor. Or if... Uh, if you weren't at economic risk from others, you could maybe just brush off insults or provocations, and it'd be okay. You wouldn't need to maintain this tough exterior. But a culture of honor is likely to occur where people are at economic risk and the state is weak or insufficient. Can you stop text messaging in my class? Thank you. Okay. Where did the southern culture of honor come from? Well, now here the ideas get a little bit weirder. Uh, according to Nisbet and Cohen, cultures of honor are common amongst herders. Uh, like herding, you know, like herding societies, societies where people herd animals. Okay, now that's a strange thing to say, but they said it anyway. And they're saying because herding societies tend to be societies where your property, your economic property, is at high risk of being stolen. Right? Like you never know when somebody might take your animals that you herd or whatever. And then also herding societies tend to be uh, in places where the state is weak and insuffi uh, insufficient because they tend to be rural societies and also ones, again, where there's lots of possible theft to be monitored and you just need a huge state to really cover that. So herding requires proving a willingness to defend one's property uh, when somebody comes to steal it or attack you or something like that. Or this is their theory, that in a herding society, you need to prove that you're willing to just go off on somebody who messes with you because that way you develop a reputation that deters people from stealing your stuff, basically. And so they point out that the South was settled essentially by herders, the Scotch-Irish, and so on, but that the North was settled by farmers. Uh, and this is like white immigrants to the United States uh, during you know colonial period. The South is filled up with all these supposedly pugnacious Scotch-Irish people who uh, like to fight and like to herd. I, I know. And, and the North is settled by these farmers who, you know, how are you going to steal their crops, right? It doesn't make any sense. You can't steal the crops, or if you did, it would be kind of a waste of time. So this is Nisbet and Cohen's argument for where the Southern culture of honor came from. We may or may not buy this, but it would be interesting to test, test whether there really is a Southern culture of honor, regardless of where it came from. Another reason, perhaps, why there's a Southern culture of honor, and this ties into the, the issue of having a weak state or a weak government that can't protect you, 
is that the South has historically been rural and low population density and has also had a sort of uh, suspicion of federal centralized government. So in general, the South has had a less strong central government. They've, been, they've had less strong government, uh, less government to protect them. And so to fill that gap, you might uh, develop a culture of honor where you defend your reputation and you deter violent crime and property crime through your reputation. It's another way to deter crime than to have a strong state, and the South didn't have a strong state. So what am I talking about when I talk about the southern part of the United States? Basically, the deep South, you know, like Georgia, South Carolina, uh, you know, Louisiana, Mississippi, and so on, and then also West Virginia, Tennessee, and Kentucky, which are not always considered part of the South, but they are in this analysis. I, I think of them as part of the South. Uh, they point out, though, that much of the West is culturally similar to the South. And by this, they mean Texas, Oklahoma, and like the mountain states, like the big, big mount, mountain state, whatever states they're referring to. I don't know. Okay. So uh, why do we think, let's, well, let's talk about the evidence for higher rates of crime in the South and, and then move, move on to uh, evidence for a, a culture of honor in the South. So patterns of crime. There's a higher murder rate in the South. Uh, the murder rate in the South is higher, and especially argument-related murders rather than felony-related ones. So it's not so much that uh, people are more likely to rob a liquor store, get confronted by the store manager with a gun, and then shoot him in the South. That's not any more likely really to happen in the South than the North. But people are a lot more likely to shoot a family member, say, in the context of an argument, or get into a barroom brawl wherein somebody gets knifed and dies or something like that. That's more likely to happen in the South than the North. A certain category of murders that are argument related is much higher in the South than the North. Uh, by the way, this is less true in southern cities. The difference is mitigated in cities, possibly because there's a lot of population movement from the North and the West and the Midwest through cities. You know, many of you perhaps have lived in southern cities and you've noticed that southern cities, while southern, are also a little bit like every other city as well. Okay. On to the cultural argument. So the South has different attitudes towards violence. On the one hand, the South has greater support for use of murder to defend oneself, home, and family. If you do nationally representative surveys of like, is it okay to kill somebody to defend yourself or to defend your home, or if somebody breaks into your home, should you kill them? Uh, people in the South are much more likely to say, oh yes, yes you should, than people in the North. Um, and same for defense of family. So this is consistent with this argument that part of why there's higher violence in the South is because they have this culture of honor and defending oneself and one's family's honor. Also, there's greater support for the police using violence in the South on national opinion surveys. Also, in vignettes, vignettes are when, on a survey, you're given some scenario and then you're supposed to say what you would do in the scenario. And in vignettes, Southerners are more likely to uh, say that they would use violence in response to somebody leering at their wife. Uh, which is kind of amusing that they did that study. And also uh, insulting their wife's morals. Like they, they did these studies where they took a, rep, a random sample of Southerners and Northerners, or just Americans, and then later categorized them into Southerners and Northerners, and asked them, uh, what would you do in the following vignette? You know, uh, some guy at a bar is staring like incessantly at your wife. You know, do you hit him? Do you let it go? Et cetera. Also, uh, you know, somebody, says your, you know, says some naughty, nasty words about your wife, you know, do you, do you kill them or not? And uh, uh, Southerners are apparently more likely to support the use of violent crime in such situations. Also in vignettes, Southerners are more approving of, of hitting a drunk after being bumped accidentally, uh, which these researchers, Nisbet and Cohen, got this put on the general social survey, which many of you may be familiar with. It's a, it's a sociological data set of Americans' attitudes towards a bunch of stuff. And easily, like, the weirdest question on there is this one that's like, okay, you're walking along the street, you're coming away from dinner with your wife, and then somebody, some drunk walks up and accidentally bumps into her and doesn't apologize, do you hit him or not? And it's like this, this scenario. Southerners are much more likely to say, yeah, you got to hit that guy. Southerners are also more supportive of physical punishment of children. They're more supportive of, like, spanking, uh, hitting children, stuff like that. The South also has different attitudes towards violence continued. OK, whatever. OK, continued. So <laughs> whatever. All right. Uh, more Southerners buy and carry guns. Uh, Southerners also are more supportive of free access to guns. And Southerners are more likely to report that guns in a house make that house safer, despite uh, research to the contrary. 
Um, so how can we be sure, though, that Southerners are actually more violent due to a culture of honor? You know, like maybe they just have attitudes where they just are uh, more accustomed to violence, more at home with violence, and think violence is, you know, an okay solution to problems and stuff. And who's to say they're wrong, right? It's subjective, ultimately. How do we know that it's really a culture of honor that's responsible for that difference? And uh, what some researchers have suggested is a way to test that would be to uh, challenge some Southerners, some Southerners and some Northerners, some men from the South and North, white men, because that's, this is the population of interest here, uh, challenge their honor and see if they respond differently if they're from the South than if they're from the North. There's a question over here. Yeah, you may well be right. Yeah, I don't know that I would present it that way, but I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's important um, that we look at this and you know try and size it up as a phenomenon to be understood as social scientists or as students in a social science class. So let's try and get this and understand how it works, um, and then we can all, of course, make our own private judgments. Um, being from the South, I'll sometimes poke a little bit of fun at this, having been on the, the wrong end of the Southern culture of honor a few times. Um, uh, but I hope you cut me some slack on that. Okay, so study one is called the asshole study. Now, I know you're thinking, that I'm always cursing in class. This is not my fault. This study is actually called the asshole study. Uh, it says as much in the abstract, so, um, which is the funniest abstract I've ever read. Uh, so here's this study. Here's how the procedure for this study worked, okay? Uh, Northern and Southern white males were recruited to participate in this study at the University of Michigan. Again, I said the University of Michigan is like the leading place to do cultural psychology along with Berkeley. Well, that partly started with this study, this, this famous study. So they bring these subjects into the lab and they're given a questionnaire and they're asked to go down a long, narrow hallway to go fill it out in some subject room. And as they're on their way uh, down this long, narrow hallway, they pass a confederate at, uh, who's at a filing cabinet, who's just a plant, you know, a confederate, you know, like an actor in league with the experimenters, just like uh, in the Ash study. Uh, so they go down this long, narrow hallway, and they pass this confederate who's working at a filing cabinet. Then the participants finish their survey at the end of the hallway, and they come back down the hallway, and at this time, the confederate turns away from the filing cabinet and bumps into them physically and then calls them an asshole. Uh, like mumbles it beneath their breath. Like turns around and is like, bumps into them and is like, asshole. <laughs> like that. Which is totally ridiculous. Um, so, and then half of the participants were not bumped. And so this is a nice design, right? Southerners and Northerners bumped and called assholes. You know, what's going to be the difference in the way they respond? Well, the way they measured this was in two ways. They planted witnesses uh, also in the hallway who were not involved in this situation. They, were, they acted like they were just like working on something, I think, put their heads down. But they actually, you know, as you would guess, were very closely observing the reaction of the subject who gets bumped and, or doesn't get bumped in the other conditions. Uh, and is making notes, they're making notes, trying to assess based on looking at the person's face how angry they are and how amused they are. And the researchers kind of thought, well, these are kind of the main ways you might react to being bumped like this and being called uh, a bad word is uh, maybe you'll get you know, pissed off and, or maybe you'll be amused and kind of laugh it off. And so they, they rated these two things. And then also another way that they evaluated the participants' responses to being bumped and provoked was to give them a story scenario to complete wherein someone hits on a man's girlfriend at a party and then you have to complete that story as far as like what would, be a, what would happen next in the story. And here they're interested in maybe after you get bumped and you're provoked, you're more likely to uh, kind of project violence into scenarios and scenes that you're looking at, including the one you're supposed to complete here. So what were the results of this study? Were they right about the Southern culture of honor, that men can be more easily provoked uh, when their honor is challenged or threatened? Well, here's what they found. Southerners showed less amusement and more anger upon being bumped than did Northerners. Uh, the Southerners were also more likely to complete this story with violence after being bumped. So bumped Southerners were more likely to complete this story in a violent way, 75% uh, of them did this, than when they hadn't been bumped, only 20%. That's a huge change, right? Like in terms of how they fill out this story, uh, do they fill it out with violence ending this scenario? 
uh, bumped and unbumped northerners not nearly as big a difference, and it's going the other direction, right? They're uh, less likely to complete the story with violence uh, when they've been bumped than when they haven't been bumped. Yes? So where did they get these Southerners from? What about New York City? Those people are, are really mean and all that, you know. Yeah, so uh, uh, point well taken. Uh, they didn't randomly sample people from the South and the North, so uh, they're taking kind of convenient samples of Northerners and Southerners that are available in, you know, at, at the University of Michigan amongst the undergraduate population. Uh, so these are convenient samples, and abstracting the larger population should be done very carefully, you know. Um, so. But one thing I will say is I think study three in, in today's lecture will help address some of what you're talking about. Uh, so when we get to that, I think some, some, of your, some of your concerns will be addressed. And then also remember that we started this by observing that Southerners and Northerners, based on real random samples of the South and the North, are more likely to say that hitting a drunk would be appropriate if they bump into your wife, uh, that you should use violent force when you're provoked, and so on. So in these vignettes that aren't these rigorous, careful lab experiments, but are also insightful, uh, where they do have random samples of each population. Those are consistent with these data as well. Okay, so study 1B. They, they re-ran the study, the same exact study. Uh, st again, Southerners and Northerners are bumped and called assholes or not. And then they took saliva samples from them before and after the bump uh, in order to measure their cortisol levels and their testosterone levels. Cortisol is a stress hormone. It reflects stress and anxiety. And then testosterone, well, testosterone's a hormone that is complicated in terms of what it causes or correlates with. In this paper, they say testosterone is a good hormonal measure of preparedness for aggression. But I, uh, I don't know that that's exactly the best way to describe it. It is correlated with aggression and violence. Uh, that, is, that, that, that is true. Okay, so they took two samples because they want to see, does the bump lead to a different pattern of increase or decrease, a, a different pattern of change in these test, uh, testosterone and cortisol levels among Southerners than amongst Northerners. So it's getting kind of complicated, right? Now you have a time one and time two, Southerners and Northerners, testosterone and cortisol levels after they've been bumped or not. That's some complicated stuff. <clears throat> but what, what they predict is that the cortisol levels for the bumped Southerners will increase more than the cortisol levels for the bumped Northerners. And the testosterone levels for the bumped Southerners will increase more than the testosterone levels for the bumped Northerners. So what did they find? Did they get it right? They did. Bumped Southerners showed double the cortisol level change of unbumped, uh, unbumped Southerners or either the bumped or unbumped Northerners. So there's Bumped Southerners, unbumped Southerners, bumped Northerners, unbumped Northerners. All of them, I believe, increase in cortisol levels a little bit, but the Southerners who are bumped increase in their cortisol levels by a, a factor of two more than everybody else. So they're getting stressed out, okay? That's, that's what this indicates. Cortisol is a stress hormone. It's indicative of feelings of anxiety in a situation, and, and it, it's increasing for these Southerners. Even more impressive are the levels of testosterone and how those changed. Southerners who were bumped showed almost triple the testosterone level increase of unbumped Southerners or either the bumped or unbumped Northerners. So this is a rare example where we have not just behavioral or, or self-report data, you know, like survey data, also observational data with people rating the anger and amusement on these people's faces, but we also have gotten under their skins and measured uh, their hormonal levels. And there's a hormonal signature here of preparedness for aggression and high levels of stress hormone that indicates that Southerners are more provoked and taking these uh, bumps more seriously than the Northerners. So then they did a third study, and this again is like the first two studies. Southerners and Northerners are bumped and they're called assholes or not. But after the bump, they had subjects be approached quickly by a six foot three, 250 pound Confederate. <laughs> Very strange study. So, okay, so now I believe the way this works is they go down the hallway to fill out the survey, and then as they're coming back, they get bumped. And then they have to like take a turn and go down another hallway. And then at this time, they see a 6'3", 250-pound guy who I, I want to say was a Michigan football player coming right at them as they walk down the hallway. And why why they, why they do this? Why are they messing with these people so badly? Um, 
Well, they actually had a reason. Uh, the reason that they did this was because they wanted to set up a chicken game. Does anybody know what a chicken game is? I'm very hesitant to teach you what a chicken game is. Um, <laughs> So chicken game is anything where two people, usually men, are coming at each other, and then the last one to give is the chicken. Um, and it's a test of courage. Have you ever seen, uh, or what is a famous movie that has a chicken game in it? <laughs> Rebel Without a Cause, exactly, exactly. Where the two guys, they actually drive towards a cliff in that one rather than right at each other. I don't know why, it's a variant on the, uh, on the chicken game. It's a very clever variant. Uh, can anybody think of any like 1980s movies with chicken games in them? Really? Crybaby? Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Nice. Nice. Crybaby. That's a good one. Yes. American Graffiti. Oh, yeah. No, that's a drag race, though, right? On the street with Harrison Ford? Yeah, I guess you're right. Okay, it's a chicken game. All right. Uh, 1980s. 1980s. Yes. Footloose. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. I watched Footloose like 50 times in the summer of 1986. I don't know why I just admitted that. Um. <clears throat> But one of the great scenes in that movie is when Kevin Bacon is driving a tractor, because it's like the Midwestern version of Rebel Without a Cause, and he's driving a tractor dead at this other guy, and he seems more courageous than the other guy, but it's actually just his shoelace got caught on the thing. I don't really know what they were trying to prove there. But uh, so anyway, uh, so that's a chicken game, and so they want to set up essentially a mini chicken game, right, to test your resolve. Because presumably, if you've been uh, provoked and you're ready for aggression, you're ready to fight, one measure of that would be how close are you going to get to this football player before you budge and let him go. And so uh, what they found was that, oh, okay, and then after they measure this, uh, they, I think they had a video camera that measured how close you got to the Confederate before budging. Um, and you don't know you're in a chicken game. You just are thrown into one. So it's sort of an everyday chicken game. Uh, so after this, they, the participant is introduced to another confederate, and they're told something about how they can't speak to the other confederate. They're just supposed to shake hands. And so the, but they, the, the other confederate had witnessed them being bumped. So when they first had come down this hallway and got bumped by the person coming out the filing cabinet, somebody else was here as well and saw them, and the subject knows that they were seen by this other confederate, and then they have to shake hands with that person. And the reason, uh, the reason they do this is they want the confederate to rate how hard the person shakes his hand because, okay, so this person's seen you get bumped and insulted and not do anything about it, and then you get a chance to shake his hand. And the, the researchers are thinking, oh, you're going to shake it really hard, you know? And then also, uh, they wanted to see what the participant would guess that confederate thought of them, you know, because you got bumped and you were called an asshole and this person saw it, they're thinking that the southerners are going to think that guy thinks I'm weak and, and whatnot, and that's why I shook his hand so hard. Okay. So what did they find? Uh, results. Okay, so first, here's behavior in the chicken game. They measured how close did they get to the football player before budging. The northerners who were not bumped went within 75 inches, just over six feet. Uh, when they were bumped, they went a little closer. They got a little bit ticked off, and they took it out on this poor six foot five guy that wasn't responsible for it at all, six foot three guy, whatever. Uh, so they went uh, five feet after being bumped. The unbumped southerners went uh, Gave after uh, gave it 110 feet, uh, but when they were bumped, they gave it or 110 inches. Sorry, and then when they were bumped, they gave it at just three feet. So that's an enormous difference. The unbumped Southerners actually got well out of the way of that football player. Uh, normally, at about 10 feet, they were, or nine feet, they were like, "Get me out of here." But if they'd been bumped and provoked, they went to within three feet, uh, which is a big difference. Very very interesting pattern of results. Uh, even though this is not the same guy that bumps you, you're pissed off and you're ready to fight. So your testosterone level is high, your cortisol is high, uh, you think people should fight, people that insult wives, all that stuff, and then you uh, challenge this football player, even though it's probably not a good idea. Bump Southern participants also gave firmer handshakes to that Confederate who'd seen them be bumped. A uh, very clever measure of trying to behave in a more dominant way. Also, uh, the evaluator rated them as more domineering. Uh, so the subjects acted more domineering after the insult, but no effect on Northerners. And then also, insulted Southerners thought that the evaluator who witnessed the bump would view them as less manly, courageous, more wimpy, and so on, whereas the Northerners didn't think that, they're, that they would be perceived any differently if they were bumped. So remember, when they get bumped coming down this hallway, there's, a, there's another Confederate who just watches them, and then the participant later says, what do you think that person thought of you? 
And so when you know, the Southerners think that person thinks I'm wimpy and not a man, if they, if they uh, were bumped and didn't do anything about it, the Northerners are like, no, nah, I, don't, I don't think they're going to judge me any differently. I got bumped. That's not my fault. Okay. So that's the asshole study. Pretty strong systematic demonstration of the tendency for Southerners, when provoked, to be more violent than Northerners, uh, to see violence in their environment, and also be higher in levels of cortisol and testosterone. Yes, sir? Uh, is it a culture of honor or is it an inability to handle emotions? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. You, yeah, that's a potential alternative explanation, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. All right. Um, though, why is it different among southern white males and northern white males? Probably some kind of cultural reason, you know. I don't know. Um, by the way, they talk about in the book on the Southern Culture of Honor, they have all these like all this really interesting and rich qualitative and historical data on like old Southern traditions of honor defending fighting. Like they uh, they used to do something in the South when two guys are really mad at each other, where they would grab each other's shoulders and then kick each other in the shins like as hard as they could until the other guy gave before you did, uh, which is totally messed up. Uh, and they did something else, like where they'd tie your arms together, and then you'd, you'd fight until somebody like passed out or tapped out or something like that. I don't know. It's like ultimate fighting kind of stuff. Uh, very terrifying, terrifying ritualistic behavior. OK. Uh, study two. OK, so here's another idea. Um, maybe it's the case that one of the contributing factors to the higher rates of violence in the South is that violence in the South is more tolerated. Southerners are more used to it. They're more likely to see it as a reasonable way to defend your honor in situations. And they're just more accepting of it. And maybe that set of norms that accepts violence in the South at a higher rate is uh, partly responsible for why we see higher levels of honor defense in the South. And I actually have a personal story on this. I remember I, was, I dated this woman in the South who was, I guess you might describe her as sort of a Southern Belle type. She was a very nice woman, and we dated. And I remember I was telling her about the Southern culture of honor research one time. I was like, oh, you're going to love this. You know, like you're from this old Southern family. You're going to love this stuff. This is hilarious. <laughs> We're always dealing with this down here, you know, people fighting needlessly. And I'm telling her about this, you know, about the asshole study. And I'm like, and then the Southerners, they actually want to fight the guy, right? You know, and she's like, yeah, that's what you do. You have to defend your honor when you're provoked. <laughs> you have to defend your honor when you're provoked. You defend the honor of your family, of course, and your girlfriend. You know, you would defend the honor of your girlfriend, you know? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know, baby. That's why I was telling you the story. That's <laughs> <I'm just> like, <laughs> like, what, what, what was wrong with these Northerners anyway? That's ridiculous, yeah. The Southerners, that was the control condition. Yeah. So these, these researchers had this hunch. They didn't want to settle for this qualitative data that I had. So they went out and they wanted to gather some systematic quantitative data on this tendency of Southerners to be more accepting and encouraging of honor-related violence. Uh, so what they did was the following. They mailed 912 letters that were requesting job applications to uh, companies in the South and the North. And in the paper that they wrote up coming out of this, they don't say what the places were they mailed it to, but you can totally figure this out. Like they say some large chain of like uh, stores that's clearly Walmart, and then, it, and then another like a motel chain. Probably, I don't know what motel chain. There's quite a few motel and hotel chains. Probably Motel 6. I don't know what the hotel chain was. Some family restaurant. I'm not, what do you think that would be? I don't know. Den yeah, yeah, but it was Denny's. Yeah, because it's like the early 90s or mid 90s. So it's probably Denny's, good one. Uh, and then a motorcycle dealer. Yeah, figure that one out, right? OK, so half of these requests for job applications, they're applying to be, I think, managers at these places. But they're asking, can I get a job application so I can apply for this open position at your place? And so half of the, applica half of the letters requesting applications said the following. <clears throat> There's one thing that I must explain because I feel I must be honest and want no misunderstandings. I have been convicted of a felony, namely manslaughter. <laughs> You'll probably want an explanation for this before you send me a job application. I got into a fight with someone who was having an affair with my fiance. One night this person confronted me in front of my friend's bar. He told everyone that he and my fiance were sleeping together. He laughed at me to my face and asked me to step outside if I was man enough. I was young and didn't want to back down from a challenge in front of everyone. And as we went into the alley, he started to attack me. He knocked me down. He picked up a bottle. I could have run away, and the judge said I should have. Uh, 
It sounds like a Johnny Cash song or something. Uh, <clears throat> but my, pro uh, my pride wouldn't let me. My pride. Instead, I picked up a pipe that was laying in the alley and hit him with it. I didn't mean to kill him, but he died a few years later at the hospital. I realized what I did was wrong. Okay, so they're interested in, will this person get a job application from these, uh, these businesses in the South and North, right? And whether there'll be a difference between the South and North. It's, it's totally ridiculous, right? Okay, it's totally ridiculous, but it's a, kind of a brilliant study design. In the control condition, it's just Grand Theft Auto. They're just like, it's the same intro where, you know, I must be honest, uh, you know, no misunderstanding, I've been convicted, convicted of a felony, I went to jail for Grand Theft Auto for stealing a car, which, you know, to the, in the North or in the West or the Midwest is like, oh, gee, at least you didn't kill somebody, you know? Uh, but their theory is that in the South, it might be the other way around. Okay, so they got 112 responses. So for the most part, people were like, no, we're not sending a job application to you, you're an ex-felon. Um, but they did get 112 people who responded, and Southern employers were more likely to send the honor killer an application than were Northern employers. So they were more likely to say, okay, you were defending, you know, your wife's honor and your own honor. You didn't mean to kill the guy. You feel bad, and you got him real good. So, you know, we'll send you an application. Um, then this one is amazing to me. This is amazing. The southern employer was actually more likely to send the application to the honor killer, the manslaughter guy, than to the auto thief. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? Like, I can understand that in the South they would be more tolerant of an honor-related murder and stuff, but to literally prefer the murderer. Uh, to work in your store than than the uh, auto thief is either it's, it's nuts, you know. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, like, uh, well, like, yes. Like, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you would you would do well as a store manager in the South, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and the point is, it's culturally relative, right? Who's to say who's right or wrong here? The point is, in the South, they had some kind of line of reasoning like that, I guess. Or, or this cultural thing of just, this is okay, or this is more okay than that, and in the North, they don't, you know? So we, I shouldn't be making value judgments. There's another question in front? No? Cool, cool, right on. All right. Uh, and actually, this is the qualitative data on this study is very interesting. So this is the quantitative data. You know, the, mer the manslaughter guy, uh, you know, not so bad. You know, the southern people are like, you know, sign that guy up. I want that guy to be a manager in my store. Um, but then some of the responses, uh, like the warmth of the responses, they went and coded them, and the southern uh, letters back were warmer. They tended to be more forgiving and kinder to the manslaughter uh, the guy who'd done manslaughter than, than in the North, than the letters from the Northern employers. And one example is the following letter that the researchers got back from a Southern employer. Uh, as for your problem of the past, anyone could probably be in the situation you were in. It, it was just an unfortunate incident that shouldn't be held against you. Your honesty shows that you are sincere. I wish you the best of luck for your future. You have a positive attitude and a willingness to work. Those are the qualities that businesses look for in an employee. Once you get settled, if you're near here, please stop in and see us. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. Okay. All right. Now we're gonna we're gonna pause, take a couple minute break, and then we'll resume the lecture. And I'll, uh, I'll also announce because we're giving you the essay back, the uh, Cool and Luke essay, um, and uh, I'll announce which reader has which names and all that stuff, and you can get it after class. All right. So moving on in the Southern Culture of Honor lecture. <clears throat> okay. What about politeness? This is one of the big alternative explanations that people would say. They'd say, well, not really an alternative explanation, but sort of a challenge to this whole line of research. They'd say to Dove Cohen and Richard Nisbet, they'd say, what's going on? You know, like, we all know that Southerners are more polite than, than Northerners. So how could it be that they also fight more? This doesn't make any sense. How is it that Southerners are more sensitive to honor provocations, to threats, to bumps? Um, they're more likely to suggest that people will use violent crime. How can this be the case when we also know that Southerners are more polite and hospitable and whatnot? Okay, so the motivation for the following study is that the South is known for high rates of violence, but also high levels of politeness, and how could this contradiction be maintained? How could this be the case? So Cohen et al. suspected that the two might actually be related. That it's not just that the politeness is some kind of exception 
to this general pattern of greater aggression or violence in the South, but rather that the two might actually be causally related. And specifically his idea was that perhaps in the North, people give you signs that a conflict is brewing and getting larger. And this is where I said I'd return to this when talking about New York City. I don't remember who said the New York City question. It's a good question. What about New York City? This is a great example of New York City behavior. When you uh, irritate uh, someone in New York City, they will let you know. They will let you know immediately. You know, they will not be polite in the face of like some small rudeness. You're going to know. You're going to know even if they're a total stranger, you didn't mean it. Um, but in the South, politeness perhaps prevents these warnings. And so what happens in the South is that you do something a little bit rude, a little bit rude, a little bit rude, nothing happens, and then maybe you eventually cross some line in the sand. It constitutes a threat to the honor or reputation of the Southerner, and then they blow up on you. And that's this theory that they had, is that there's a different pattern of uh, the relationship between threats uh, or insults and violence in the South than in the North. That in the North, People, uh, they give you these signs, you're pissing me off, you're irritating me, and in the South they don't do that, they just blow up. So Cohen et al. wanted to test this study, or test this idea with some study. And they're like, well, how do you, how do you test this idea that there's a different pattern to the reactions to provocations and little insults that build on one another in the South and in the North? They're going to need a pretty weird study to test this, right? And that's what they came up with. So this is what they did. They ran this study at the University of Illinois, and they labeled it an art therapy study. And it wasn't really an art therapy study, but that was the cover story. And they invite southern and northern subjects to participate, uh, all uh, white men again. And they're invited to participate in a study that once they get there, they're told, we're going to ask you to do the following task. We want you to do relaxed drawing with these crayons. It's very nice. Relaxed drawing with your crayons. And we want you to really express yourself, because this is about art therapy. And we put a video camera in this room to you know, observe you expressing yourself. No big deal, it's a video camera. And then they surreptitiously made another subject who participated in the same session be a confederate of the experimenter. And the confederate, uh, the confederate is supposed to irritate the subject, basically, and see how they react. That's basically the design of the study. So the first thing that happens is the confederate shows up late, kind of irritating. And then after the instructions that the research assistant gives, the research assistant leaves, and the confederate goes, what a loser. <laughs> For no reason, no reason, just to be a jerk. And then the annoyances by the confederate uh, start to escalate with one every minute. So the confederate has memorized this list of annoyances to annoy the participant with and does one every minute. So the first one, the, remember, they're both supposed to be drawing with crayons and expressing themselves on this task, where they're doing uh, relaxed drawing uh, as a form of art therapy. Uh, so the, you know, the subjects are doing this. They're being good subjects or whatever. And the uh, confederate comes over, grabs two of the participants' crayons, and says, let me get a couple of your crayons, Slick. I'll give them back later. <laughs> it's kind of irritating. Why are they doing this, right? Then the next thing, the confederate comes over and goes, this really sucks. I hate drawing, uh, and wads up a paper and throws it out and the trash. OK, sort of annoying. Then, oh, and no, that was part of the first provocation. And then the Confederate throws another paper ball and accidentally hits the participant uh, in throwing it out and goes, hey, hey, watch out there, Slick. <laughs> it's getting more annoying, right? It's getting more irritating. Then the third annoyance at the third minute. This is only three minutes in, mind you. Uh, the Confederate hits the participant again with another wadded up sheet of paper and goes, oh, sorry, Slick. I was trying to hit the basket. So, not only is the participant unable to do relaxed drawing effectively with the crayons, <laughs> but they're hitting you with the wadded up pieces of paper as they screw up. Very irritating. Fourth annoyance, the confederate comes by, takes two more crayons, and says, I need these ones now, Slick. He's totally taking advantage of the participant. Fifth annoyance, confederate hits the participant with another piece of paper, another wadded up piece of paper, and goes, Slick, man, you keep getting in my way. And then followed by another uh, wad up sheet of paper, and he goes, he shoots, he scores. So he's sort of, you know, overly impressed with himself, too. Then the sixth one, this one's really irritating. Uh, the Confederate goes up to the participant and goes, hey, great artwork, Slick. I can tell you're really in touch with your inner feelings, but you need to put your name on it. Then write Slick on the participant's <laughs> drawing. Yeah. Very annoying. <laughs> then. Seventh provocation, the uh, confederate hits the participant with another piece of wadded up paper and says, you're sitting there like a sitting duck. Maybe I'll call you duck instead of slick. Very annoying, very stupid. 
And then the Confederate hits the participant again and says, sorry about that, duck. I should say really quick that I remember when this paper came out, one of my friends in grad school like came flying up the stairs to like read the series of insults to me because he just thought this was so hilarious. It's so strange to see this in a scientific paper. Uh, and then the ninth provocation, uh, <laughs> confederates the participant, he's like, duck, you need to duck, and hits, hits the participant again after saying that, mind you. Okay. Tenth provocation, the confederate looks at the participant's drawing and says, you know, Slick, your drawing is pretty weak. I know. He's trying to express himself in this relaxed drawing with crayons. It's already a sort of emasculating setting. Um, and he's, being, he's having his drawing criticized. And then the 11th and I believe final uh, provocation, the confederate hits the participant again and says, I don't know about your drawing, Slick, but you make a pretty good target. That's pretty bad. That's pretty mean. So. They videotaped this, right? And then they had blind coders. When I say blind, I mean like people that weren't aware of which, whether these people were Southerners or Northerners or whatever, uh, people like us, you know, just, just people that were hired to rate the reactions of the participant. And these people rated, uh, as usual, anger uh, and amusement. You know, how angry slash amused were these people as they got all these provocations. And uh, they also rated what apparently was the risk of a verbal or physical confrontation at any point after each one of these 10, or is it 12? 11? 11, thank you. 11 provocations. So they're like, okay, you know, on this videotape, let's go forward to the first provocation. How angry slash amused is the participant? <clears throat> How likely are they to verbally or physically confront the subject? Um, then, uh, okay, and then we analyze this. And okay, so one thing is they had to cut the study short because two participants made physical contact with the Confederate. So they had to discontinue the study. Both of those participants were Southern. So that right there is kind of interesting data. But that wouldn't be a statistically significant difference, so we don't stop there. So for the first few annoyances, they find that Southerners didn't react very much. So now they're looking at the anger and amusement ratings as the provocations increase. And for the first few, they're like, the Southerners just kind of smile and nod. They're just like, yeah, how you doing? You know, whatever. Do you want some grits? You know, it's all, all, all is well. Um, I know, that was, low. that was bad. OK. So I'm from the South, so I get to do this, supposedly. Um, I know, I know, that's bogus. OK. So, uh, so for the first two annoyances, the Southerners are polite. They don't, they don't say anything. But the Northerners show agitation and anger. They're like, why don't you stop doing that? You know, you're irritating me, and you're bothering me, and I want you to stop. But then uh, the Northerners. They were more angry up to the line in the sand. There was some kind of line in the sand that they were trying to identify after which the Southerners might blow up. And they find that up to that line in the sand, the Northerners were getting more and more angry. And then past that line in the sand, they also seemed to get more and more angry. Uh, and the Northerners kind of stay, oh, actually, that's not true. They kind of plateau. They sort of get more and more angry, and then they sort of plateau at a certain level of anger relative to amusement. But the Southerners spike way upward at annoyance number six. So uh, at annoyance number six, the Southerners have been acting polite and not being very annoyed. And then they shoot up, and they just kind of snap. And they just get really mad. And, uh, and they, OK, and, and so what you're probably wondering, what's annoyance number six? I don't know if you remember this one. This is easily the most annoying one, in my opinion. Uh, this is where it would be hard not to blow up. This is when the Confederate goes up to the participant and is like, great artwork, Slick. I can tell you're really in touch with your inner feelings. But you need to put your name on it and then write slap. I mean, that was the one where we had the most, like, oh my god, they did that to this person. So on that one, the Southerners blow up after keeping their cool for quite a while. Um, OK. Then also, uh, they analyzed the biggest spikes on a per participant basis. And they showed that the Southerners generally showed bigger anger spikes. It wasn't just that overall their anger tended to spike up after annoyance number six. It was also the case that for each participant, the average uh, highest spike between annoyances was higher for the Southerners on average. So regardless of where their anger spiked, uh, if it did at all, the Southerners spiked more. So they're more likely to suddenly get really provoked. <clears throat> and then after the study, you'll be happy to know, in classic Phil Zimbardo fashion, the Confederates were reconciled with the participants. So the participants were assured this person's not an asshole or not a jerk to you. You know, this person's OK. And they, but they actually did this not just to be ethical. Uh, they also did it because they're interested in the data they might get from it. Uh, so they measured the forgiveness uh, via willingness to shake their hand. So they're like, OK, this is the Confederate. The whole thing was a big joke. Why don't you guys shake hands if you're willing to? And what they found was that Southerners were less likely. Uh, oh, no, no, that's not true. The Southerners who blew up were more forgiving 
And then uh, on a survey that came six months later, they were less likely to remember characteristics of the Confederate. But those who did not blow up were not forgiving and did remember. Okay, so, and then amongst Northerners, they had the opposite pattern. This is very confusing. So what does this mean? What this means is that a lot of the Southerners blew up. They had this huge spike of anger, but not all of them did. And the ones who didn't, you might be saying, oh, they're cool with the whole thing. They're fine. They didn't get angry. But no, they actually are less willing to forgive the person afterwards. And six months later, they still remember the Confederate when they're sent a survey about the person's characteristics. So the people who don't ever explode, they kind of stew, you know? The Northerners had more of the pattern you might expect, right? Where the ones who blow up, they're uh, less likely to forgive, and they remember it more six months later, you know? So the Northerners, some of them got really mad, or pretty mad, and some of them didn't get very mad. And the ones who got mad weren't very forgiving and remembered the person later, because they'd gotten mad, you know? But in the South, it was more everybody got mad, and then some of them exploded, and some of them didn't. And the ones who didn't, they stewed. So, so the model here is sort of like a pressure valve or something, where in the north, they're kind of slowly releasing that pressure valve the whole way. You, you tick them off, and then they'll tell you. They'll be like, you, you're pissing me off. You need to stop, you know? And then if you keep doing it, they'll keep releasing the pressure. In the south, they don't release the pressure. Norms of politeness dictate that they have to let the pressure build and build and build. But then eventually they can't. And if they can't, then some line in the sand gets crossed, and then they blow up on the person. And if they don't blow up, it's not that they weren't angry. It's not that the pressure got released. The pressure just never gets released. They don't forgive the person, and they remember six months later. Is this clear? OK. All right. So, so the Southerners got more and more angry, and then they either blew up or continued to stew. Northerners either got angry or they didn't. OK, study two in this paper. Study two in this paper. We're in study three. This is getting confusing. I'm sorry for that. OK, so Southerners and Northerners, remember they videotaped these people. So then they took a subset of those videotapes of real participants in study one. And they showed a bunch of new Southern and Northern participants tapes of either the most or least angry participants, but then cut them off right before, like, you know, I think the sixth trial or something like that. So you're brought into the lab if you're one of the participants in the study. They code whether you're from the South or the North, and they show you, here's some videotapes of participants in a prior study, and we irritated the heck out of these participants. And they're told, why don't you try to guess when these people are going to, or who's going to blow up? And they cut it off before the person actually blows up. And so it's like, a, it's, like a, you know, it's like a person perception game. Can you detect which of these people, these like four or six videotapes of these pe different people, can you detect which ones are going to blow up? And so their prediction is Southerners are not going to be very good at this. And that's part of why they get in fights all the time, is they don't realize when somebody's about to blow up on them. And so indeed, that was the case. The Southerners were not as good at predicting blow ups ahead of time. So now they have kind of a couple mechanisms, right? Uh, it's not just the case that Southerners are very polite and are more polite than Northerners, and so they stew and get more and more angry, this pressure valve model of provocation in the South. But also, they're less likely to be able to see when somebody else is about to blow up, perhaps because they've grown up in the South where everybody just sort of blows up all of a sudden. Um, OK, whereas Northerners are like, that person's about to go. That person's ready to go. I've seen this before. This is not pretty. OK. So then in study three, they're interested in, well, we've been telling you that there's a relationship between violent crime and politeness. We've been showing it to you in a lab setting. So what if we looked at, uh, at, at more macro level data between, uh, about cultural variance and rates of violent crime? And so here, they look at the relationship between the politeness of cities, uh, which has been assessed in the past. By the way, there's this guy, I think his name is Florida, Richard Florida, which is a cute name for someone who does research on regions of the country. So Richard Florida, he does research on cultural variants in the United States and how different parts of the country are different than others, uh, which is interesting research. And he, he has a composite index for uh, city politeness, which is essentially a composite of how many uh, charitable donations are made per capita, uh, how much people are willing to help a blind person cross the street when they, they take people that are blind and like make them cross the street in cities in the south and north and then code how likely somebody is to come help them. Uh, and also willingness to make change. They'll have, you go, they'll have some Confederates go out and say, hey, can you give me change for a dollar and stuff and see the rate at which that happens. People in the South, they love to give you change. Great place, great place to get change. Uh, 
They'll, they'll also uh, drop items on the street, like the lost letter technique, right, where there's like a stamped on, uh, envelope that's dropped outside of a mailbox, and they see whether somebody will ever put it in the mailbox. And uh, again, in the South, good place to drop your letters and accidentally not put them in the mailbox. And they found, yes, in the South, cities are more polite, but also homicide rates are higher. But is it the case that the cities where, that are more polite, the homicide rates are, more high, are higher? Anyway, in the North, they found that the more polite the city, the less the murder. Okay, that makes sense, right? That's kind of what you would expect. In the South, they found no relationship, but a slight tendency towards more politeness being more cor correlated with more murder. Um, so these are kind of tentative results where they're trying to go from the laboratory to the field. And it's not the most convincing evidence you could see, but it is consistent, roughly consistent with their thesis. That in the South, politeness contributes to violent crime, uh, but in the North, it actually deters violent crime, which would be kind of what you would normally expect. So it's very interesting research. Okay, so putting this all together for some conclusions. Uh, studies 1A, B, and C show that insulted Southerners can be, uh, get more angry, less amused. They're more likely to project violence onto targets. Uh, they have higher cortisol and testosterone levels when they're provoked. They're more physically challenging, even to an enormous guy that they probably shouldn't challenge. Uh, they behave in a more domineering fashion. And they believe that other people will perceive them as unmanly and weak. Uh, in study two, we saw that honor-related violence is tolerated more in the South and North, even encouraged sometimes with job applications. And then in study three, we saw that politeness in the South may function to promote violence. Uh, and that small signs of anger, which are not consistent with being really polite, but uh, are useful for deterring big blow-ups or big violent, um, you know, fracases from breaking out, that those, those sort of things are more common in the North than in the South. And that also we found that Southerners are worse at picking up small warning signs, probably from lack of prior exposure to these small warning signs. So taken together, I think these researchers have done a pretty good job of sort of charting, yes, there is a greater tendency towards violence in the South. Yes, it is driven by efforts to defend one's honor uh, or reactions to provocations to one's honor. And in turn, uh, politeness norms help propel it and the greater cultural acceptance of violence in the South uh, propels it as well. So that's the Southern culture of honor.